Good morning, everyone. Well, depending on your time zone. My name is Dan Hips. I'm a member of the philosophy faculty here at UC Merced. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our talk this morning uh, by Charles Pence. Um, first, just uh, some notes on etiquette and procedure. Um, so I've uh, disabled microphones and video for the talk portion, just out of general Zoom bombing concerns. Although feel free to use the chat as uh, some folks are already. I will note uh, for those of you who are coming from outside of philosophy that the norm in philosophy is to save questions until the end of the talk. Um, so uh, Charles, uh, I think might very reasonably choose to just ignore questions posed in the chat. Um, Charles will speak for about 45 minutes today. And then afterwards, um, I'll uh, moderate questions from the audience using the raise your hand function on Zoom. And we'll be starting those with questions from students um, initially. Um, let's see, the other uh, procedural point I wanted to note is that uh, the talk this morning is being recorded. Although UC Merced philosophy doesn't have a YouTube, so I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with the recording, but there is a recording being made. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Charles Pence is chargé de co, which I guess is equivalent to an assistant professor at the Université Catholique de Louvain in louvain la neuve Belgium, where he directs the Center for Philosophy of Science and Societies which has possibly an acronym that is possibly pronounced Cephesis. I'm not sure, that's how I pronounce it. Uh, Charles also serves as the co-editor for the journal Philosophy, Theory and Practice in Biology or PTP Bio. It's a fantastic, uh, entirely open, open access uh, philosophy of biology journal. His work centers on the philosophy and history of biology with a focus on the introduction and contemporary use of chance and statistics and evolutionary theory. His lab is also one of the foremost groups integrating this work with methods of the digital humanities and is increasingly engaged in the ethical implications of biological science and technology. Uh, I will also note that Charles uh, has been a good friend of mine for something like 15 years now since we were in graduate school together. Uh, lots of fond memories of uh, vegan potlucks and uh, getting drinks together at uh, one of a really fantastic Irish pub in South Bend, Indiana. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming Charles Pence. Great. Let me get myself unmuted here. Dan, thanks so much. Yeah, this is this is a, a really, really fantastic invite. I really I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And as well, thank you all for uh, for being there. I see a bunch of actually both delightfully familiar and and unfamiliar faces in the in the in the participants list. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, to see you all turn up. Yes. Hello from a, 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 a sort of pale evening uh, from our university campus outside of Brussels, uh, about an hour, uh, an hour outside of Brussels in the French speaking region. So uh, hello, uh, welcome. Um, what I am going to be doing tonight, yes, or today, sorry, uh, this morning, tonight, in insert time zone here, um, is talking through the argument of my uh, brand new book, of which you see the cover here, uh, came out in paper form, about a, a couple of months ago now. Um, this is the first time I've ever done a 45 minute talk on a 180 page argument. And so uh, we'll get it, I'm, I'm gonna do my best. This is a novel thing for me. Uh, this is the first uh, a book of this size that I've ever written. So I'm really happy to, 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 work, to work through it with you guys tonight. Um, just, uh, well, the, the rest of the remnants of a title slide, mostly to say uh, thanks to the NSF. So this was, uh, this was work that was partially funded by uh, the National Science Foundation before I, before I uh, left the US. Um, so let me start by uh, motivating the project a little bit. So what, what, why, am I, why am I here? Um, the whole thing comes out for me of, of noting a simple fact that I, I, I draw attention to a lot in a, a fair amount of, of work that I do, uh, but I think, it's, I think it's still kind of, kind of interestingly striking. And that is when you go back and read The Origin of Species, which I strongly recommend. It's, it's, a, it's an absolutely delightful read. Um, 
you get struck by the fact that a lot of what happens in the origin seems really familiar uh, from a 2022 uh, perspective on the philosophy of the life sciences, on evolutionary theory, et cetera. A lot of it reads really naturally. It's, uh, it, 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 it's surprisingly uh, contemporary. That makes all the more shocking or striking the times when it doesn't seem that way. When something happens in the origin uh, or something's missing in the origin that, uh, that, that, that we would expect to be there and, and it's not. Um, I have a bunch of these that are actually form a lot of sort of research topics for various things I'm interested in in the history and philosophy of biology. But the starting point for this project is to note that there's not a mathematical formula in here. There's not a mathematical formula. There's not a statistical distribution. There's not a graph. There's one phylogenetic tree uh, that's playing all kinds of really interesting rhetorical roles, but there's one phylogenetic tree. Um, it does not take very long at all for this to change. So by the time you get to the early 1930s, this is one of Sewell Wright's first adaptive landscape diagrams. This is about the distribution of a population in an abstract space consisting of trait values being measured by a property that we now then would call fitness, a word that Darwin didn't use. Um, these are mathematized models. They are statisticalized models. They are populational models. You get none of that in the origin of species. So that happened really quick. A contemporary evolution textbook can't make it 30 pages without drawing a graph of something. So how, how did this happen? What happened here? Something big happened in, uh, I'm calling it a century from Darwin's first sort of concrete notebook uh, sketches in the 1830s to about 1930. I'll, I'll talk more about why I put a, put a pin in 1930 in a little while. Uh, so why, when, and how did we make this change? Uh, and let me put the point a little more clearly and a little bit more detail. I want to you know, pull on four threads here, uh, things that are uh, uh, either missing in Darwin or missing in some of Darwin's immediate successors. Um, we see the construction of a statistical theory of evolution. And it's a theory that could let us understand the action of natural selection. So it's a theory that, that directly invokes selection, that gives us a handle on explaining selective phenomena. Uh, it's cross-generational. Um, it's described at the population level, um, as opposed to being about individual adaptations, what happens to individual organisms, how they get the characters that they get, um, except indirectly, of course. Um, and then another thing that happens in the middle of this century is what has come to be called the rediscovery of Mendel. So Mendel's work happens also in 1830, is largely uh, forgotten, or uh, there's a more complicated story here that I could talk about in the Q&A if people are interested, but uh, suffice it to say for the moment that it doesn't become historically very significant until about 1901. Uh, but after about 1901, any theory of biology worth its salt was going to have to pick up uh, at least some understanding of Mendelian, uh, Mendelian transmission. Um, now, I'm going to have a couple of brief kind of context sections. So if you're not super up on the history and philosophy of biology literature on this, I'll get back to my own story in a couple of slides. But I, I, if you are familiar, you're going to know that there's a lot written on this, including by people who are in the chat right now. So um, I, want to, I want to contextualize a little bit kind of some of my foils that I've, that I've had in, uh, in, in, in developing this, this story. Um, the classic source for what's going on in this period is uh, Bill Provine's The Origins of Theoretical Population Genetics. And this is a really, actually really lovely book, uh, meticulously researched, a bit cantankerous and unusual because Provine was a bit cantankerous and unusual, um, but it's really, it's really nicely done. I'm going to caricature him a little bit here, but I want to pull on a thread that I think is present in both Provine and some other historians. Uh, uh, who've, who've looked at this period that I think will kind of comparatively illuminate what I'm up to in this project. Um, on the classic story, we can think of the classic story something like this. Um, we start with Darwin. Now, Darwin has, as I've sort of already uh, alluded to, this 
individualist uh, theory of uh, natural selection. Uh, it's a very, uh, so that's, that's one important, uh, important facet here. Darwin's somewhat concerned with populations, but he's not concerned with populations the way that a contemporary biologist or uh, even a historical population geneticist would have been concerned with populations. He's got a very individualistic uh, uh, lens. Um, and it's a very, it, it's what's now come to be called a gradualist theory. All organisms get all their characters very slowly, bit by bit, right? And those two, those two strands, especially the gradualism on this classic story are picked up by, comes to be called the biometrical school. Don't worry more about that in a second, but Carl Pearson, WFR Weldon are your central figures. Uh, meanwhile, in what's sometimes called an anti-Darwinian vein, precisely because, uh, not gradualist at all. Uh, the rediscoverers of Mendel and developers of early genetics, including William Bateson, sort of relaunch uh, uh, sort of novel efforts to try to uh, uh, build a discontinuous uh, Mendelian theory of evolution. But, and here's the key, the key move, the key thing that's happening in this period, according to the classic story, is that these guys get into a fight that is so nasty, so bitter, and so in the end, it's, it is argued meaningless. But actually what happens that matters for the history of biology is R.A. Fisher, Sewell Wright, other architects of contemporary population genetics sort of sift through the wreckage and they pick out what's good in Mendel and what's good in Darwin, ignore everything that's gone on in between those two points in time and just sort of rebuild evolutionary theory in the 1930s and 1940s, starting from nothing right? That's the idea here. And you get this in a number of, in a number of different histories. Um, I won't read the quotes, but Provine and uh, the geneticist Alfred Sturtevant, so that's a proper actor's history. I mean, he was there at the founding of the new synthesis. Um, they look back on this period with a kind of like wistful regret. There's some like nostalgia. Like biology could have advanced 20 years in the blink of an eye, but instead we wasted 20 years on this nasty personal fight between uh, Bateson and Weldon and Pearson who just couldn't get over themselves, right? If only they'd been able to all get along, they could have figured out that they could have all worked together. Uh, which is exactly what Fisher and Wright would have found uh, or went on to find, I should say, a few decades later. Um, now, in short, what I want to do tonight is argue against this idea in a couple of different ways. I want to present an alternative historical account uh, and philosophical account that I think is more illuminating and more and more interesting than this kind of frame. Um, I'll get there in just a second. I have two more quick caveats to, to give you before I do, though. Um, the first thing to say is, despite what you might be led to believe by the title and general structure of the book, this is very definitely not a story of the development of statistical method or statistical techniques. Um, you can do better than that already. Uh, between Stigler's, uh, Stigler's uh, history of statistics is fantastic on this stuff. Uh, Balmer's biography of Francis Galton is fantastic on this stuff. There are other places that you can go if you want to learn the ins and outs of why Francis Galton developed a particular method of regression in the particular year that he did and what that meant precisely. I'm, that, that's, that's, that's not the fish that I, that I want to, to, fry, uh, to fry here. Um, the other thing, and this is a bit more complex and a bit stickier, uh, is that this isn't a history of eugenics. And that may be a little bit surprising because among the authors that I will talk to you about over the next half hour are uh, Carl Pearson, Francis Galton, and R.A. Fisher, the sort of trifecta of the developers of British eugenics in the early decades of the 20th century. And so I have a lot to say about eugenics. I think it is an extremely important and interesting part of what's going on here. I also think it's not playing as directly into the story that I want to tell as you might think. I think there are some reasons for that. Uh, again, I'm happy to say more. Um, I'm also happy to gesture at really phenomenal work. Uh, the historians of eugenics have been doing great stuff in the last uh, 20 and 20 or 30 years. Uh, again, as I said with mathematical statistics, better than I would have done it. So uh, I can, uh, Mazumdar's book is phenomenal. And I can, I could, I could, I could obviously give more references than that. Um, Okay, enough about what other people already did and what I'm not going to do. Let me talk about what I actually did do. Um, I can say more about relationships between what I'm doing and other projects in the Q&A. That's, that's something I'm happy to talk more about. Um, 
I could sum up the major theses of the book in two pretty brief slides, actually. Um, so first, I want to push the idea that there's a lot of really interesting philosophical work happening in this period. So <clears throat> the biologists who are the first to introduce these concepts of chance and methods of probability uh, and methods of statistics into evolution, including at the very least, the kind of major cast of characters from my story, uh, as you'll see in a second, Darwin, Galton, Weldon, Yule, and, and R.A. Jedna Yule and R.A. Fisher, um, they were really self-conscious about their relationship with probabilistic and statistical reasoning. They knew they were doing something that no one had ever done before. They knew they were doing something new and exciting. Uh, and so in the process, they actually developed really rich philosophies of science. They thought very hard about how to justify what they were doing to their contemporaries. Uh, those have not, I think, been, uh, been, been explored in enough detail up to now, at least not in a kind of single, single narrative. So that was, part of, that was part of my goal. The other part of my goal is, and here's where I get to arguing against the giant red X from a few slides ago, uh, what, what's also sometimes called the debate between biometry and Mendelism. Um, I think that the idea that that's the interesting thing that happens between 1890 and 1920 in biology is really mistaken. I think, in fact, if you get into the details here, if you look at the practitioners, uh, the practitioners work, uh, you get a story of continuity. There's a lot more sort of commonality going on here than a kind of uh, a big, uh, a big angry fight narrative uh, would lead one to believe, at least with respect to these questions of, of chance and probability and stats. Maybe there are other ways to drive more wedges. Uh, I didn't write six biographies, obviously. Uh, there, there's more to be said about all of these figures than I'm going to say. Uh, but I still think there's, there's, a real, there's a real continuity story here. So again, I, I make this case with 180 pages of detailed historical narrative. <laughs> Uh, so what I'm going to do now is try to give you enough highlights in 30 minutes um, to whet your appetite, to convince you that those two theses aren't, not, not that they're true, because there's no way I can convince you that they're true in half an hour, but to convince you that uh, it wasn't a stupid idea to try to write this book, and maybe it wouldn't be a stupid idea to try to read this book. Um, so that's, that's the goal. Um, if one of these figures in particular, I should say, because I actually, I have bonus slides. Um, if one of these figures in particular interests you, uh, and you want to know a little bit more about like, wait, why would he say that about that? I have, I can say a lot more uh, in the Q&A. So don't hesitate to like push, even if you want, pretty, pretty aggressively on on, you know, I'm not sure about your reading of Galton. Fine, like we can, uh, we can absolutely talk about that. So we begin with the man himself, uh, the myth, the legend, uh, Charles Darwin. Um, Darwin is interesting in this context, I think, other than his sort of intrinsic interest and the fact that he documented his life so well that he gives a lot of material to historians and philosophers who want to know more about him. Um, he's interesting in this context I think largely because he's not very systematic about what he has to say about chance and the various assorted concepts surrounding chance. Um, he never does anything that looks like formal statistical method. Um, Andre Aryev would, dis would disagree with me here. I could say more about that in the Q&A, but I don't think he ever does anything that looks well like formal statistics. Um, he deploys a number of notions of, of chance, though, uh, in a variety of complex and interesting ways. Uh, he spends a lot of time thinking about a sense of chance that we might now call accident in the sense that it's something that's not designed. Uh, there's a famous passage uh, that occurs in the variation where he talks about what would happen if you built an arch out of rock that had just fallen off of a cliff. Uh, you would be designing something, but you wouldn't want to say that somehow the pieces of rock had been designed to go into your arch. That's crazy. They're just geological artifacts, right? In that sense, they're accidental. And so that makes them chancy in a certain kind of way. Um, he definitely had a concept of the law of large numbers. He talks sometimes, for example, about the idea that a bigger population would be more likely to be host to a rare variant. Like, okay, cool. So he's got, he's got a, a probability notion in that kind of basic sense. He famously talks a lot, and I've written elsewhere a bunch about this, that natural selection isn't a guarantee, it's a tendency. 
right? So natural selection doesn't say for certain that the fitter organisms will do well and the less fit organisms will do badly. Natural selection says, well, all else equal, probably in general, the fitter organisms will do better mostly. Um, so he's very clear about, about that. And that has, some, that has some interesting philosophical implications that I, that I try to tease out in the book. Um, he's also very clear that we're ignorant of the precise causes of variations. So variation is a black box for Darwin. He talks sometimes about what he calls indefinite variation, which for him basically means variation where we just don't have any idea uh, what it is that's bringing about uh, that 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 particular that particular variation, and so there isn't there's absolutely an ignorance aspect here that he that he underlines that he underlines a lot. Um, that's a lot, and he doesn't really connect these different notions. Uh, except I want to argue uh, what I think is uh, really poignant about the way he deploys chance is that he tries to keep it under lock and key. Uh, so every time he gives chance uh, what what seems like a big role in something. He has this real tendency to hasten to add that, ah, but that is being watched over by natural selection. And for Darwin, despite the, the tendency aspect, and that's where the philosophical story gets a little sticky, um, natural selection is paradigmatically not chancy in the sense that it's guiding toward, it's sort of toward adaptation. It's a sort of almost quasi-rational process uh, uh, at work in nature. It's a generator of order. And so in that sense, if every time that he sort of lets chance in, he can say, ah, well, yeah, but don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Um, I'm still doing good 19th century science. We're going to be okay because all those uses of chance are sort of locked down by the influence, the guiding influence of natural selection. Uh, quick example, I just like this quote because it's Darwin at work in his book on uh, the orchids. Uh, he says here, here it's the flowers of orchids in their strange and endless diversity of shape may be compared with the great vertebrate class of fish, or still more appropriately with tropical homopterous insects, which seem to us in our ignorance as if modeled by the wildest caprice, right? The idea is, look, if you didn't know about natural selection, you would think this was all random. But once you're on the inside and you realize that anytime you find one of these strange features, which he's actually just been talking about through this book on the orchids, one of these strange features that seems like it's totally random, it's not. It's adaptive. It's probably adaptive for some reason or another. So that sets the stage for Francis Galton, another very interesting and very difficult character to, uh, uh, to interpret. Um, Galton reads Darwin in his kind of uh, 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 early middle age and then proceeds to dedicate himself, uh, Darwin's cousin, by the way, uh, dedicate himself to the study of heredity and especially of eugenics. Um, he's also a huge fan of uh, the statistical and probabilistic work of the uh, local pride here, the Belgian uh, astronomer Royal Adolphe Quetelet, who had just developed some of the first uh, treaties on social statistics in the uh, mid 19th century. Um, now, what makes Galton intellectually interesting for me and the way to kind of figure out what he's up to is to recognize, I think, a kind of paradox at the heart of, of Galton's work and Galton's impact on the generation of scholars that followed him. Um, the first thing to say here is that um, Galton's arguments from a philosophical perspective are really not very good at all. Like, shockingly not good. Uh, Bernard Norton here in his PhD thesis says, he's talking about uh, Galton's arguments surrounding natural ability. Galton tries to measure genius in the English and finds, of course, that upper class white classic British men are all geniuses. Um, was, as frequently with Galton, very bad, but the concept was powerful if vague. And uh, Swinburne, who uh, actually started out a little bit doing a history of biology, which I didn't know before I wrote this book, uh, writes that uh, in, uh, in here thinking about uh, the inheritance of characters and the use of the law of ancestral heredity, his argument is quite extraordinarily bad. Uh, and this is, I think this is not exaggeration. Uh, uh, Galton, he's slapdash with his arguments. He very often has this really annoying habit of he builds almost all of a really good philosophical argument. And then he gets to the last step and he either hand waves, he either hand waves past it 
or he introduces some kind of physical model to try to sort of, he's like, ah, you see, uh, uh, this must work because I can build a model, uh, uh, some physical object that, that it demonstrates similar kinds of properties. And you're like, Galton, that's, that's not an argument. That's a, that's a box. Um, so that's one half of the paradox. The other half of the paradox is he makes an enormous splash and everyone thinks he's amazing. So this is Carl Pearson, and Pearson spends a lot of ink later on in his career criticizing Galton's bad statistics. But then Pearson still writes, no one who studied Galton's 1889 magnum opus, uh, Natural Inheritance, on its appearance, and that a receptive and sufficiently trained mathematical mind could deny its great suggestiveness or be other than grateful for all the new ideas and possible problems which it provided. The methods of natural inheritance may be antiquated now, so this is written in 1930 at Dalton's death, uh, but in the history of science, it will be ever memorable as marking a new epoch. So people were into this, right? For all that we might critique it from a contemporary philosophical perspective. And I think that that kind of paradox is a really interesting thing to try to unpack and, and get to the other side of. For me, the key to squaring the circle is to focus on the open questions that Galton left behind. So I think what makes Galton so exciting to these figures is that is sort of they can continue those arguments at precisely the spot where Galton started to hand wave. But in doing so, Galton pinpoints if you want to build a statistical theory of evolution, which in combining uh, his obsession with uh, Kedele's social statistics and his cousin's uh, theory of evolution by natural selection, Galton certainly wanted to do. If you want to do that, Galton finds a couple of points that you're going to have to pick up, that you're going to have to engage with to build any such theory. More precisely, I think, uh, first of these is, he wants to spell out a theory of statistical evolution, a natural selection taken statistically, uh, in terms of a theory of how do characters get from parents to offspring. Uh, so he's uh, one of the first to struggle with the idea that there seems like there's a lot of characters that are passed on from parents to offspring, but don't express themselves. He calls them latent characters. Uh, maybe we can figure out a way to think about these transmission patterns that can help us understand natural selection. The other thing that Galton is persistently bad at is recovering evolutionary dynamics. And if you know Kedele's work, this may not be too surprising. Kedele talks in some of his original works. One of the things that Kedele is always struck by is the idea that um, these normal distributions of characters and populations always look the same. Every year, the same number of people commit murder in Paris. This is one of his examples. Uh, the same number of people are poisoners. Um, the people change, the stories change, but the numbers remain the same. Galton eats up this statistical idea, and then he can't figure out how to make natural selection actually change anything. And we see both of these characteristics in his classic example. You probably have seen one of these at a local science museum or children's museum. They're everywhere. The quincunx, the Galton machine, the Galton box, the bean machine, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's really exciting because if you put in a bunch of pellets, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer. If you put in a bunch of pellets at the top of the funnel here under figure seven on the left, if you put in a bunch of pellets in the funnel, they run down through all these pins and lo and behold, they make a normal distribution at the bottom. And so Galton says, this is it. This is how we can show uh, that this is what's happening when traits move between parents and offspring, when populations build themselves in accordance with normal distributions. Um, how does that work? He doesn't tell you, but he has a machine. So this is exactly the kind of argument where now uh, the, predators, the successors of, of, of Galt are going to say, okay, wait, but now we need a theory that actually lets us understand how this really happens in nature. Same thing for evolutionary dynamics. Another thing that you might notice if you have a little bit of statistical training is uh, this bean machine radically increases the variance of the distribution. The funnel here is really narrow and the uh, normal curve down here at the bottom is really fat. How are you gonna keep this appearance of things being static over time then if the variance keeps going up? Well, now look at this uh, box over here on on the right hand side, I will, we'll just put a squeezy thing in the bottom. It'll bring everything, uh, it'll bring everything together. I see I have a, there's some connection problems. I hope it's, uh, hope it's not on my end. Uh, let me know and stop me if it is. Hmm. Oh, maybe it is me. Let me pause for just a moment. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll keep rolling. Uh, fingers crossed. 
Um, let me put a squeezy thing on the bottom. And then, oh, hey, magically, uh, the distribution looks the same over time. Well, this is, this, is, uh, this is pretty arbitrary and ad hoc, right? He doesn't tell us at all. How is this supposed to represent biological reality? But that's an open problem. That's an open problem for his successors. And that takes us right to what's now come, become known as the biometrical school. So here on the, on the left is Carl Pearson with Galton on the right. Here's WFR Weldon looking like an extra from a Western movie. Um, they are the two central figures of the school that, comes, that, that sort of comes in and, and tries to polish all this up, who's really motivated by, uh, by Galton's moves here. Um, their research project starts by picking up on the second question. On the, uh, on the question about uh, evolutionary dynamics. And so for the first time, they go out and they make a bunch of measurements of, here it's crabs in the wild. I'll be talking about crabs for a couple of minutes. Um, what they're going to argue here is you've got this uh, non-normal distribution. Galton had no utilities for dealing with a non-normal distribution. Pearson is good enough at statistics to begin to develop them. Um, that starts to give you the ability to think about this curve, uh, the general population curve, the curve you see on the top, as being composed of the two curves you see inside the big curve, which maybe makes you think that, ah, there's a speciation event going on here. If the population is made up of subpopulations, perhaps they're being driven apart over time. And so we can start to maybe, at least, possibly, uh, construct a theory of natural selection on a statistical foundation. Um, they back this up with careful longitudinal studies. So here's uh, uh, from, a, from a letter Weldon talking about his colleague who then went out and measured some uh, male crabs in Plymouth Sound and discovered that there was really rapid uh, uh, change in a particular morphological character, the same one that was being measured uh, up above. Um, they then try to back this up with adaptationist causal hypotheses to try to understand what's going on in these populations. So Weldon's enamored of the idea that it's probably has something to do with the fact that we're silting up Plymouth Sound, uh, all the ship traffic. Uh, they've built a breakwater and the river is no longer flushing out effectively uh, the silt that's accumulating in the bottom of the sound. Uh, the, the organisms are, dry, are, are dying off. And so perhaps uh, my favorite thing I found in the archives, here's Weldon's diagram from his, uh, from his notebooks, crab. Um, perhaps when water comes into these crabs at the points marked by the arrow, um, it's not being filtered well anymore. And so they're dying because, uh, uh, or they're being driven rather in the direction of improved, uh, improved filtering capacity. Um, now, that was their program up until the rediscovery of Mendel's results. And here's, uh, I could say, I could talk for an hour about this photograph, but uh, essentially once Mendel's results are rediscovered at first, they try to just sort of dismiss them. It's like, ah, this must be uh, data artifacts. We haven't seen anything that looks like this. Then we get enough examples that they say, okay, what we need is a theory that can sometimes give you Mendel's results as a special case and sometimes give you the kinds of normally distributed characters that we've seen in other examples uh, as a different kind of, as a more general uh, case, if you will. Uh, they become progressively convinced that actually, or Weldon becomes progressively convinced that there's a molecular story to tell here. He goes back now to the first open question that Galton had left behind. Um, how can we tell this story of character transmission uh, in terms of the passing of, of little particulate characters from parents to offspring, but in such a way that we can interpret that statistically. And Weldon writes here, you know, Galton's old idea is the machine that will work. We just have to figure out how that's actually going to go. Um, they, they become uh, steadily convinced in talking with cellular biologists that it's got to be something on chromosomes. Of course, they, have, they know nothing of, of DNA. That's, that's not, till, that's not for, uh, for uh, 50 more years. Uh, but they're convinced that there's something on the chromosomes that must be uh, uh, governing this transmission of characters from parents down to offspring. Now, there's just one problem 
with this research. And it's, it, it, it's, so there's actually, I take, I take it back. There's two problems with this research. Uh, one of them is that Weldon dies at uh, 36 of pneumonia after overworking himself essentially to death. Uh, lesson for all early career academics in the chat, myself included. Um, dies of, dies of, dies of pneumonia. Um, now, that's bad. Uh, the other thing that happens is they don't have the mathematical tools they need to actually pick this stuff up. Uh, don't really pay attention to this equation. And long story short, what I'm trying to show you here is the 19th century methods for trying to parse hypergeometric distributions, which is what this turns into. They can't do it. The, it's technically, it's simply too complex. It's theoretically from, math, from a statistical mathematical perspective, it's just too difficult. Um, they don't have they don't have the conceptual or technical tools that they need. Uh, so this project in the end is a failure. Uh, Weldon's project to try to derive these connections is a failure. But, and I think this is the point, for the first time, right, this is all the parts of the shift that I was trying to, to, to look for right tonight. This is a statistical theory of evolution that lets us understand the action of natural selection at the population level. And they're trying to harmonize it with Mendelian trans, uh, transmission. And you have this as early as 1904, 1905. Um, that's really cool. So historical curiosity, uh, 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 duly noted. Um, there's just one problem here. Uh, and that is, if I've argued that this project fails, then I owe you a story of continuity. That is to say, why think that this matters for anything later in the history of the biological sciences? How can I resist this idea that I mentioned from the classic story at the beginning that uh, really it's Fisher and Wright sifting through the wreckage of this period and picking out the two or three good ideas that matters for contemporary biology. It's not this fancy story that I just spent, that I just spent 10 minutes trying to, uh, trying to make sense. Um, now that first line should say three. Uh, in the book, I offer three stories of intellectual continuity. This is an argument that really, that really motivates me. Um, I'm only gonna show you one of them tonight. I only have, that's all I have time for uh, this morning. Uh, the first, which I'm not gonna talk about, is there are actually a number of well-known works that sort of take one piece of uh, this larger perspective, this larger program, and advance it, if you will, in isolation, uh, without advancing the whole thing at once. Uh, there's also the peculiar case of George Udney Yule, about whom I can say more in the Q&A, a sort of uh, 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 synthetic figure before his time, a very interesting, very interesting case. Um, what I want to spend a, a brief moment on, I don't have the time to really show you this argument in detail, but is a, is a, is a case coming from the textbooks. So what happens if you look at the textbooks of evolution that were published between 1905 and 1920? Uh, do you find evidence of this bloody warfare that supposedly happened, evidence of the failure of the biometricians to make a difference, uh, the victory of the early geneticists and, and the sort of uh, uh, black hole uh, prior to the uh, development of the modern synthesis? And what I want to argue is, no, you don't. Uh, oops, wrong direction. Um, so I looked, I, I picked up three textbooks. I could, I could justify this choice more in the Q&A if people are interested, but I picked up three textbooks. Um, Locke's uh, 1902, Recent Progress in the Study of Variation, Heredity, and Evolution. It's reprinted in six editions over this time period. Um, Locke also dies uh, in the middle of this time period of uh, overwork. Um, J. Arthur Thompson's Heredity, uh, another, another uh, general text, and E.S. Goodrich's a little hard to read, but uh, The Evolution of Living Organisms. Um, what do you find in those textbooks? Well, what you find in those textbooks is careful, cautious, reasonable presentations of both biometry and Mendelism, both the statistical side and the genetic side, you don't find any indication of a hefty sort of uh, uh, all-encompassing conflict between the both of them. What you tend to see is a real desire for unification, a real idea that 
exactly the kind of theory that I already mentioned, a sort of unifying, statistically grounded, but sophisticated and careful understanding of natural selection. That's what biology should be trying to do. That should be our target right now. Uh, that's exactly what, what you find in, in these textbooks. And so that's not, that's not I think, uh, uh, what you would expect according to the classic history. I think there's a real story of, of uh, a, a longstanding continuity here. Um, how am I going to end the story? Uh, there's many ways that I could do this. Uh, I picked, as it turns out, R.A. Fisher. Uh, I can justify that briefly. One, Fisher is just really, really interesting. Another very difficult historical figure to try to understand for lots of reasons, some of which I'll talk about real quick. Also, Fisher is undeniably a part of the tradition that leads to contemporary biology. So if I can say when, with some degree of convincing this that uh, my continuity story can get us to Fisher, then my continuity story can get us to today in some way or another. And I can hand off to historians of the following few decades, again, to make that, to make that story uh, uh, more compellingly than I would. Um, so Fisher's, yeah, weird and complicated. Um, Fisher's, yeah, it's a, it, it is a fantastic beard. Uh, Fisher's, Fisher's, uh, 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 philosophical commitments are super wide ranging, uh, maybe unstable. Actually, uh, uh, I, I, I like that as a, uh, it's one of the conclusions that, uh, uh, David, uh, David DePew and Bruce Weber, hi David, uh, made in, in, in their book was that like this stuff doesn't hold together really in the end. And I think there's really something to that. Um, at the very least, of the four that I'm going to pull on for the moment, uh, deeply committed eugenicist, one of the only people I think to have plausibly lived his life in accordance with eugenics. He uh, produced children like a eugenicist. Very weird in that sense. Unusual figure. Um, Anglican Christianity. So it's uh, for him very much grounded in a, in a, in a Christian ethic. He has this view of indeterministic causation, which if you haven't read it and you're a philosopher of science and this sounds cool, he has a paper in volume one, issue one of Philosophy of Science, the journal, 1934, that is super interesting, strong recommend. And he also is one of the most important figures in the entire history of statistics. He has a very refined statistical method. Most importantly for the natural selection case, he makes this distinction between the statistics that you take on a sample and the parameters of the hypothetical population that a statistic is intended to estimate. And it's Fisher who really introduces that for the first time. And that's big. That's really important at, at, this, at this period. Uh, it's really important to help, help you understand what's happening in uh, the biological case. Uh, but he's trained in exactly this very textbook tradition. Uh, if you go find, as Anthony Edwards did, uh, the copy of Locke's textbook in the Caius College Cambridge Library, you will find that its graph legends are annotated in Fisher's weird handwriting. Uh, he was absolutely reading exactly these textbooks. Uh, we know because he worked with and then got in a fight with uh, Carl Pearson. He was super familiar with the biometrical literature. He knows all of this kind of unifying proto-synthetic literature that I've, that I've been saying is the kind of conduit for these ideas of a, a nuanced statistical theory of natural selection into the early days of the modern synthesis. And so that, for me, that's a good place to, 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 put, a, to put a pin in, in the historical narrative, because by the time we get to Fisher's Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, another very interesting book from 1930, uh, we're in the mainstream of texts that are still important for contemporary, uh, contemporary evolutionary theory, uh, for better and worse, of course. GTNS, if you haven't read it, is a very odd book. Uh, I could say more about that in the Q&A if, if, if people are interested. But we have a thoroughly statistical theory of evolution here that's a decent approximation to uh, contemporary population genetics. It looks a lot like we would expect a modern theory of evolution to look. So let me sum up uh, uh, briefly. Um, 
I haven't been able, of course, to give you to give you the full story today. There is a level of of detail that I will that I will not be able to to reproduce. Um, you know where to find it. Um, but I hope I've at least tempted you with uh, with the broad outlines. I think I, I I hope I've been able to make it clear. There's really rich, deep, exciting philosophical content in this collection of authors surrounding exactly this question, this worry about uh, how we're going to introduce uh, theoretical concepts of chance and the kinds of methods, uh, uh, statistical probabilistic methods that we would use to, to make a better sense of those, of those concepts in an empirical case. Um, they're also thinking really hard about why they would do this. Um, the subtitle of the book, in fact, comes from a critique that Weldon once received. Uh, I, I have my suspicions that it was from William Bateson. Uh, Weldon, in a, in, a, in a large address to the British, uh, British Academy, once said that uh, someone had accused him, that uh, accused to him that uh, statistical biology was just a way of saying with a pompous parade of arithmetic, something that we all already knew all along. Uh, if you're confronted with that kind of attack, you have to spend some time thinking very clearly about why you would persist uh, in the face of that kind of pressure. And they do, uh, they really do. Um, and they're also, I think, this lovely is there's this lovely story of intellectual continuity here among these very weird and very complex and very difficult figures that I think can really illuminate. I, I think historiographically, to, to, to put on a, a, my, 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 my more HPSE hat for a second, historiographically, the shift from a sort of open warfare frame to a continuous, uh, I'm almost tempted to say normal science, although that's probably overkill kind of frame, I think tells us a lot. I think it's really illuminating and really helpful to understand this period. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, the book has a website at the book's website, uh, especially if you teach biology to secondary or bachelor students, you'll find a series of six lesson plans to teach history of biology uh, to, uh, to your students in English and in French. Uh, so there's all kinds of resources there. Um, you know where to find me. Um, if, you are, uh, if you are interested, please do not hesitate to, uh, to get in touch. And I'm super happy to, uh, to talk with you more about it now. So uh, please, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, so as I said at the top, I will be uh, moderating the questions. Um, so if you could indicate that you have a question using the raise your hand reaction. Um, and I believe I've changed the security settings. So you now should be able to unmute yourself and, and me, turn on your video if you prefer. Let me, let me turn off the screen share so that that gets out of everyone's way until I need it, unless I need it again. Um, yeah. Um, and let's start off with uh, questions from any undergraduate or graduate students in the audience today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any questions from students? Okay, in that case, I guess we will uh, open the questions up in general. Um, is that a question from David DePew? It is. Okay. That was mostly, mostly an appreciation. Uh, the easy way to see you, I don't have to go to Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure. It's been a while. Yeah. I hope you're well. I'm fine. So, um, well, sort of fine. Fine as anybody else. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I mean, I found that illuminating of going back to those uh, source books in that period, because the whole story that's normally told is basically the story of genetics. Um, and that story, in turn, is often told from the perspective of the development of molecular genetics, which is like way down the road. <laughs> So the period you're talking about, what actually happened was that the development of statistical biology is really this the the main story, right? Um, um, but I so I noticed 
um, two things is that you, I, the way I told the story, which is not based on any detailed reading like yours, um, uh, is that uh, Galton got stuck on regression, which you didn't talk about too much. So the idea is that if, if you lose half of your heritability at each uh, uh, generation, uh, pretty su natural selection could not become an innovative force unless it overcame that barrier. Um, and um, I just thought you might say more about that. But the second part of it is that Yule, the way the story uh, is told in secondary books like uh, Provine, which by the way is a really great book. I can't tell you how much I, <laughs> Origins of Statistical Population Genetics, um, um, is that he, he, he was a mathematician and they, they asked him what would happen if you had um, uh, the Mendelian characteristics, um, uh, Mendel's laws basically, as you go from generation to generation. And by using the quadratic equation, he proved that you don't have any automatic built-in tendency to regression. You have <clears throat> um, a distribution of um, a dominant and recessive and heterozygote um, combinations that remains the same from generation to generation. So that the chance of natural selection uh, overcoming it, it doesn't have to overcome that big a barrier. It just simply has to introduce a force that's strong enough to basically distrib over overcome the equilibrium distribution. And that, I, I, I just wondered if you'd say more about that, yeah. Cool. Good. Uh, obviously, two great, two two great questions. Um, so yeah. So so Galton on regression. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, that is probably the place where, and I, I've been forced to clarify my thought a little bit more than that. In in I actually have a paper on reversion that I'm that I'm actually coming out any day now. Um, it had to. It sort of fell out of the book. Um, it didn't. It didn't make it into the book. Um, so it'll be out in studies in history and philosophy of science in the next in the next probably couple of weeks actually in, in preprint. Um, what I what I think is interesting about about Galton on regression is that I'm not ever sure that Galton sees clearly what Pearson will eventually see, which is that regression as a statistical idea and reversion as a biological phenomenon, the idea that, you know, sometimes if you have a fancy pigeon, eventually it looks like a not fancy pigeon. Um, I'm not sure that Galton really saw clearly that those could come apart. Um, whereas, you know, Pearson very, very uh, uh, obviously is, is the first, but I think the, the most, the most, the, the loudest, if you will, to say, yeah, but you can compute regression of offspring on parents and you can compute regression of parents on offspring. So regression can't be talking about directly, immediately an inference to some kind of hered hereditary process that falls apart immediately, right? Um, and I, I'm not sure that Galton saw that at all. So I mean, I, I don't want to deny that that's, that that's important. Uh, and I've, I've I would have written I would have written a bit about that in the book differently than I than I uh, now than I did than I did when I wrote that chapter for sure. Um, on Yule, su yeah, super interesting figure. I like I like Giudni Yule a lot. Um, the thing that I, one so so I have a lot of hypotheses about Yule, but I'll advance kind of the weirdest and coolest one because it's 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 kind of new. I think. Um, I think one of the problems with Yule is that both Pearson and William Castle misread his statistics pretty early on in like 03. Um, and so Yule is trying to do something that nobody really quite realizes what it is that Yule is trying to do. And uh, that, that kind of hamstrings him. People don't interpret him in the right, in the right kind of way after, after he gets this, he sort of gets tagged with this, uh, oh, well, he doesn't understand, he doesn't really understand the law of ancestral heredity and he doesn't really understand genetics either. He kind of gets tagged with that early on and it gives people a reason to stop paying attention to the paper. And so I think there is a weird, I, I, I tried to give an argument. I've been emailing with a biostatistician at Columbia about whether or not I succeeded at giving this argument. Maybe I didn't. Uh, but I've been trying to argue that, that actually, no, there's a way to kind of salvage uh, what he's doing if you think about it in a slightly different way, uh, which might explain why people weren't, weren't really taking him very seriously at the, at the time. 
Uh, I have a lot more to say than that, but uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to, to go into more depth soon. <laughs> Thanks. Allison. Hey, thanks so much for that. So um, I'm wondering if you can help like explain how this um, model of warfare between the biometrical and genetic views, I guess why that's why that was a, a dominant narrative in contrast to the continuity picture that that you've proposed. So like I, I take you to cast this as something of a false conflict um, that was, you know, um, developed by historians, but why would that conflict narrative have eclipsed the continuities that you've been tracking? Do you have, can you say anything about that? Or do you talk about it in the book? Uh, no, I can do that quickly. And that, that actually, that's really good. I should, I should clarify and, and, and let me make, let me make a note that, that I shouldn't, I, uh, if I give this talk again, and I hope I will, I, I shouldn't let you have had that impression. To be clear, the conflict is not a false one. These guys hate each other's okay. guts and want each other to die. It is brutal. <laughs> okay. Um, at one point, uh, at one point, Bateson publishes a book that's like a new, not very good translation of Mendel, but it's mostly okay. an excuse for him to write like 50 pages about why WFR Weldon sucks at biology. Okay. <laughs> um, Weldon, Weldon, uh, uh, writes to Pearson at one point and refers to their, uh, to Pierce, to Weldon and Bateson's relation or fight as quote, paltry and dirty beyond measure. Yeah. Well, so this is why, I mean, you kind of gestured to the, right. That there were these like very sort of public and well-known fights and conflict that happened. And so I was wondering whether we could make a distinction between sort of the, in, the intellectual continuities that that you're tracking compared to what historian like other historians might be interested in concerning the socio-political context in which they were engaging right where those conflicts yeah. would take the forefront yeah no i mean i think i think i think it's how to put it i think the other hypothesis that i have for this this is probably the one that holds more water uh, um because i i do go into this a little bit at the start of chapter five um I think if you pay too much attention to, in particular, if you pay too much attention to Carl Pearson and William Bateson, you actually do get this idea. Uh, this idea comes through in their writings. So I think there's a great man history problem here. Pearson, for his part, actually does pretty much say, I'm a quit doing evolution because I'm tired of fighting with these people. He practically says as much, right? He stops going to conferences. Uh, he stops writing papers on evolutionary theory. Um, Bateson basically starts writing in textbooks like we won and we don't have to talk about those people anymore because we won the social fight. Um, so if you read them, but you don't look and you don't look at the textbooks, I think that's where you get the I think that's where you get the bad impression. OK, cool. Thank you so much for that. This was great. <clears throat> sure. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry if I butcher the Irish pronunciation. I believe it's Nula. Yeah, totally spot on and, and totally cool if you butcher it. It's kind of fun to figure out what people say. Um, this was awesome. I have like a gazillion questions, but I won't hog all the time by asking you. But I, but I do have one question for you and it's really simple, but I know that it's not gonna have a simple answer is, um, you talk about the terms chance and population and I was curious what your historical actors define, but also you as the person analyzing it, because that, that was kind of, as I was going through it, I was like, what does he mean by population? It's still sort of so up for grabs. So if you could say maybe a little bit about what your actors mean and, and certainly what you mean as an analytical tool of chance and population. Thank you so much. This was so good. Oh, well, that's, uh, yeah, good. Uh, uh, it, 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 it. You don't need me to tell you it was a good question. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, what can I say that won't, that, again, what can I say that won't take an hour? Um, let me take population first. Uh, population, um, you're right, obviously in flux during this period. Um, I am not sure that... Um, I'm not sure that Galton has a clear idea. 
when Galton talks about having a clear idea, what he seems to have in mind is something very concrete and real life. So he talks about, you know, statistics means you could take the actual living inhabitants of England and sort them by height and get a bell curve. Like the humans, the physical human beings, you could put them in a line. Um, Pearson seems to have, Pearson and Weldon seem to have a fairly similar kind of idea. I actually, I actually think I've, I have, I have largely, uh, I've largely picked on, uh, picked up the analysis. I think, uh, I think Margie Morrison's exactly right in her, she has a wonderful paper on this, uh, where she says, uh, uh, it's not till Fisher, and one of the things that's big about the Pearson-Fisher disagreement is that Pearson has this kind of actualist, presentist understanding of a population, and it's only Fisher who can talk about populations that aren't really there for the first time, about a population as an object of scientific modeling, as an abstract construction that evolution is going to apply to. I think she's spot on. I think she's spot on with that. Um, I'll stop population there now before I fall in a hole. Um, chance is harder. Um, so largely what I am, what I am looking at is a sort of, I mean, the five second answer to this question is it's part of the project of the book to try to demonstrate all the manifold things that these different authors had in mind when they decided to deploy those kind that, that notion. Um, but the, 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 for me as an analytic tool, what I'm looking for are, this is probably the quickest way to, yeah, this is the quickest way to say this. Um, I think Darwin's hesitation to deploy or to, to, to let chance out from under the blanket of natural selection has to do with a deep and abiding commitment to a kind of broad Newtonian methodology that 19th century science was supposed to be about deterministic laws that would guarantee to you what would happen to populations. And so maybe selection can give you that if it's, if it clamps the vice down tight enough, uh, maybe it can give you that. Um, and so there's this shift from that to, and, and, and actually here, I think, I think uh, uh, David's account's really good. Um, letting, letting chance be an active ingredient in your, in your scientific theories, letting anything that's not absolutely hard Newtonian predetermined play a real role in your scientific explanation. I mean, we all, we all tip the hat to hacking here. I think Hacking's really wrong about Galton, but that's a separate concern. Hacking, hacking gives all the love to Galton here, and I think that's entirely wrong. Uh, but uh, I think hacking in general, this idea that what matters is we'll let chance be a first-class citizen in our scientific explanations. That's the move I'm looking for, as hard as it is to pin and to pin and define intellectually. So that's what I'll say for now. <laughs> Okay, I, there was a hand from David Ardell. Um, Hi, yeah, that, I did have my hand raised. Uh, so um, congratulations on your book and thank you for this wonderful talk, which um, I really enjoyed. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, reading your book and, and, and also thanks for mentioning these resources for the this history uh, for students, um, because I do teach evolution. And I'll, I'll mention that I have my my wife here is also a professor of evolution. She's teaching evolution this semester. So we, you know, so I, um, I have a question and I have two quick reflections. I'll try not to take too much time to, I tried to distill the reflections into this question. So the question is, I'm looking forward to learning more in your book about you know, specifically uh, impacts on the process of review for, for evolutionary biologists. So you mentioned the textbook case. And I mean, um, and the reason I'm asking about this and, and the impact of the personal, you know, animosity between these schools and how that affected other, you know, third parties in that period, um, be, because, um, 
because I imagine that there were impacts. Uh, at the same time, I also, so my two quick reflections are, I really uh, buy your, your argument, of course, that there, of the continuity of ideas, and more importantly, that of science as a population process with variation and diversity, um, you know, as opposed to um, the, that, that we would tend to simplify the telling of the story by personifying these ideas in certain people and kind of oversimplifying it as a, like a, the warfare of the Greek gods, you know, and, and it's easy to go that way with, especially when you're talking about someone like Fisher. And so the other reflection, which goes, um, I, I guess a little counter to the argument is, is the, ironically, of course, Fisher is famously combative about, um, you know, the, the next stage of history of science. So in the causal role of smoking tobacco with cancer and the dominance of the randomized controlled trial. And so the dominance of, and then, and, and in fact, we're still today living with this stultifying impact of frequentist statistics on education and research. So we're still just generations later, still facing you, you know, the shadow of this personality. And so, so that's my, you know, that's, those are my reflections. Thanks a lot for your talk and very much. And to this great group of, of, of listeners, I've just enjoyed being part of this uh, event. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really, I, I, I really appreciate, I really appreciate both of those. Let me, let me, let me chip in, let me, let me, let me chip in my two cents on the latter one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, how to put this another nice thing about stopping my story in 1930 is that it meant that I could stop trying to understand Fisher in 1930. <laughs> um, because he is so difficult. I spent probably six months on the first, whatever that would be, uh, you know, 25 years of Fisher's career. Um, I cannot imagine what it would take to, I mean, just to, to really actually get into those motivations of, of what happens a little bit later. So I, I don't, I definitely don't want to deny that, that, um, that there's this double-edged sword here that these big personalities have these, have these kinds of, these kinds of longstanding, these kinds of longstanding effects. And, and, uh, uh, you know, he's, He's less well known because the shadow's not quite as long, but uh, Carl Pearson has exactly the same, you know, exactly the same kind of impact. So, I mean, I'm, these are these are difficult people to say the least, uh, and and distasteful all as well. That's the other, except except, well, okay, Charles Darwin seems like he was a, by the standards of the day fairly decent, um, but I mean, this is a this is a tough period to be a historian to do you know, new history in. I mean, this is hard. But uh, but no, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Thanks for that. Uh, ben? Yeah, hi, Charles. Thanks for that uh, really interesting talk. Um, and I have what is probably an annoying question uh, to ask about a figure who's not in your talk at all, um, despite all the names that you mentioned. And I'm curious if you've read or have any thoughts about um, what Charles Sanders Peirce has to say about chance um, in this conversation, uh, a previous uh, questioner asked, and then there's some, some discussion in the chat about this as well. And um, yeah, he was basically talking about the ontology of chance and kind of giving it uh, saying that it's that the real force and that you know laws of nature themselves evolve out of chance. So I'm just curious if you had any thoughts about that position. So I'm going to give you a I'm going to give you a glib answer and then I'm going to totally walk it back. The glib answer is um, shockingly enough, um, he's nowhere in the transmission chain, and so you know, in, 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 in trying to tell this, this, this really, uh, grounded continuous, uh, story, um, I would have loved to have wedged him in to wedged him in. And I didn't find anybody talking about, it. um, now um, let me walk that back some, um, I am really interested, although I haven't yet had the chance to do it. Um, in doing more to extend this story stateside. Now, this is a very English story right now. 
Um, I mean, I also want to extend it uh, uh, Belgium side to uh, uh, Belgium side and France side now that I have the language. Um, I didn't when I started writing the book. Uh, <laughs> so that, I think, uh, uh, the closest I get to the States is a couple of those figures. When I mentioned that there was this, there was this little bubble of work in the aughts and teens of people sort of taking little parts of this and running with it over time, some of those are Americans. Um, and I really am interested to look at, at that story better. Um, obviously, well, really to see if I can do anything that's not just a bad version of Trevor Pierce's awesome stuff that he's already done on this. Uh, Pragmatism's Evolution, uh, U Chicago Press 2019 or 18 or 19. Um, go buy it. Uh, Trevor's, Trevor's awesome. Um, Trevor nailed the, the pragmatism connection. Uh, and, but, I, but I don't know to what extent he picked up the chance angle. Right. So I, I it is on my to do list, uh, but I do not have anything uh, uh, intellectually satisfying to say about it in the meanwhile. No problem. Thank you. Uh, since we don't have any hands currently, um, I would like Allison to ask her question from the chat. because I'm super oh, interested sure. in this. <laughs> sure. Um... So, well, I was wondering whether Chance was, now I just have to look at what I wrote. Okay, yeah, what was Chance black boxed as something of a, an occult quality similar to what Kuhn said about gravity for the Newtonians? Because I remember, you know, reading Kuhn and he was talking about how it was a concern at the start, but that eventually, so over time, the Newtonians just kind of accepted gravity as this innate tendency. Um, and they like, ignoring the earlier fear of scholastic science. And so do you think, like, could we say, I mean, I put maybe ditto in this case, right? Because the way that you express sort of Darwin's fear of this, and then is there like an increasing comfort over time or an ignoring of it? Yeah. Like, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's really great. So I think it's close to that. I think what I would want to say, um, although I should, okay, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what is sort of my, my, my personal party line on this. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to caveat it immediately. Um, what I have said before in print for that matter, um, is that this isn't, it's almost like that, but that, that has a metaphysical cast to it. And I think it's methodological rather than metaphysical. If if you let if you're the sort of philosopher who lets who, who lets yourself make that distinction, I know some people would just toss that out the window anyway. But um, because I think I think it's very much about the mold of what it meant to be doing good 19th century British natural science, mm -hmm. um, and that what that and, and sort of what that looked like if you are a good student of your Herschel and your Yule and your Mill uh it in the in the time period what that meant was um we find crisp causal laws here this is what we do um we don't find fuzzy uh uh fuzzy vague f fuzzy fuzzy vague stuff oh, no huel not uh I, I i am i am at the university that houses the husserl archives but that is not my uh that's outside my remit um uh I, I think it was just it just it just it just was outside the realm of what he would have been willing to call scientific. I might even mm -hmm. I might even I might go so far as as to say. And it took a while for that to kind of crack apart. But especially if they're looking for like mechanical explanations, right? Because that was the concern with the occult occult qualities, as far as I take it, is that there was no kind of like mechanical explanation of our nature that would fit it well within the frameworks and so it seems like by black boxing kind of um you know the wild caprice right this it, it does sort of the same thing it allows it to like have a placeholder and function but like don't worry because it's you know we can just kind of ignore that and has this kind of background passive yeah yeah and what it, you right? get over the 19th that's really interesting is you lose the mm -hmm. the hard mechanical but you keep the methodology yeah. because they want to make room for the wave yeah. theory of light yeah 
and they don't yeah, have a right. mechanism for it. Yeah, right. <clears throat> um, but that was that's the I think that's the I think that's the I think your your head's in exactly the right place. I think that's the that's the move, right? It's the it's the heritage of mechano Newtonianism yeah, that yeah. that just just takes us off the table for a while. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Carolyn. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was really interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about your preference for continuity over revolution in general, and if that's a general preference. And because I'm not familiar with the literature, what um, maybe it's not just you personally, maybe this is a trend in philosophy of science that I'm unaware of. The one thing that I could see coming out of your talk on this was that in the classic story, it seems like a lot of a lot of credit is given to Fisher. You said, you know, he kind of picks out from the ashes the story that just wasn't there. And then at the end of your talk, you said that Fisher had actually read these, these pieces that do some of that work. So it seems like from that example, that part of the reason you might favor continuity over revolution is so you don't incorrectly put all of the credit into the hands of like one seemingly crazy person um is that what we're is that what you want to do you want to like socialize science or show show a more distributed credit or are there other reasons too i'm not sure i've ever asked myself this before so i'm gonna like freestyle for a second in 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 my answer i i don't i don't have a i don't have a canned i don't have a canned answer ready for you um this is a really cool question um i feel like so on the one hand, yes, I mean, I, I do think there's something to, um, I think this is, this is in some sense playing into a broader trend of, it, it seems difficult to, how to put it, once we begin caring more about practice, which is assuredly a, trend, a general trend in the philosophy of science over the last 30 years, um, once we start caring more about practice, it seems difficult to sustain anything that looks purely like a great man narrative, right? And so if I, if I think, as I do in this case, that the, the warfare narrative is a legacy of a great man narrative, then there is a sense in which that's, those, those aspects are, are, playing in, are playing into each other, I think. Um, I do also think that you're probably not wrong that there's some kind of personal preference at work here too. I mean, I am a kind of, oh, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a card carrying HPS guy at the very least. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm pretty on the, on the spectrum. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uh, uh, out there in terms of, you know, I think that the, I think that the, 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 the social construction and meaning making type stuff that's going on in science is is really really important, uh, and we we can't we can't jump over those those parts in our stories. And so you're probably right as well that there's just a little bit of like I'm kind of wired to find that in here. I think probably. But thanks. I've, yeah, I've never really tried to think about that before. That's a really great question. David Depew. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, this is just a comment and then hope that um, Charles uh, and other people might say something about it. That is that you kind of black boxed when you began talking, but only maybe for the talk, um, sort of the um, nature of probabilities. Um, uh, so if, if I have, uh, I want to talk here about, this was triggered off by the remark about Purse. Um, so I, 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 I think that in Charles Darwin's days, what you mentioned, uh, and all the other methodologists, that they really did have an ignorance interpretation of chance because the world had to be a certain way. Um, and that if one law failed, they all failed. <laughs> um, and I, I also take the point now that I'd never seen clearly before, that is that in order to get around that without changing their metaphysics, as it were, there's a kind of positivist um, phenomenalism that develops um, as the uh, sort of matrix 
in which all of this stuff occurs um, uh, uh, that results in uh, well everything from statistical mechanics to uh, the neo-Darwinism, um, let alone social science. Okay, um, but about Peirce, I actually think, and I could be wrong, I mean, I've studied his texts, a lot of them, um, and they are as confusing as anybody else, but uh, um, I actually think that he has um, a pro what's called a propensity interpretation of chance. That is, chance is actually built into the universe. <laughs> uh, the, the nature of the world itself is chancy. Um, and that he develops, by the way, he and um, um, maybe one or two other people are the only people in America at that time that really understood the new statistical mechanics. And he also saw very quickly that this was going to cause a big problem for philosophy because philosophy had built into itself since Kant. Uh, a, a kind of way in which Newtonian mechanics becomes an a priori truth. <laughs> and he, so he is simultaneously revising Kant and revising Newton. <laughs> um, and uh, he, he, so he thinks of laws as the leading edge of a wave in the universe that is getting harder and harder. And that the things that we call fixed laws are like the backwash. <laughs> of this open front, right? I mean, it's an extraordinary vision. Um, and and um, I just want, I, I think that there are people now, Karl Popper was one of them who hold these propensity interpretations of reality. Uh, other people uh, do too. Um, I, I, I think that might actually be a kind of a wave of the future, but um, uh, I just wanted, I, I think that's a good reason why he's not in the story. I don't think anybody got this. That's that's always a way that uh, 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 one can be too far ahead of one's time. I think yeah. that's I think that's absolutely possible. <laughs> also, talk about weird guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I I had a I had a professor in graduate school re relate to me an experience of trying to deal with the purse archive once. It sounds like it's not a whole lot of fun. Um, <laughs> bit of a mess. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's 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 spot on. And there's there are uh, the. the now I really do just have to say there's threads of that all the way through the book and it's and it winds up coming it winds up becoming complex enough that I can't even I can't even do them quickly justice here but you're exactly right that that's that's got to be one of the things that's moving around over the course of this period for sure and it is um, Thank you. yeah Jeff yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I hope you don't mind. I guess since we're near the end, I was going to zoom out to the meta disciplinary level. And this question is meant in absolutely the friendliest manner um, and not boundary policing. I just realized as the talk was unfolding, I don't know, have a lot of experience with history and philosophy of science. So I was kind of waiting for, you know, here's the argument, the philosophical argument. And then part of me is thinking, well, this is um, this is like scientifically informed philosophy of science informed history. This could have been done in a history department. Look, and I'm very interdisciplinary. I get this kind of thing all the time. What is this philosophy? Is it cognitive science? So I'm. this is purely like, could you give us a little, like, how does, how do things often go? What's the game? You know, it's, it, it's, it seems a little bit like, especially the last few threads, like history of philosophy is a thing, right? And so why shouldn't history of science and philosophy of science be a thing that's carried out in roughly the same way? So I don't know if you could just talk a little bit about you know framing this kind of inquiry for me. Absolutely, no. That's a that's a great that's a great question because uh, uh, we are a progressively rarer breed. I think, unfortunately, uh, uh, there was uh, there was a time when, and it was I think largely between the kind of '60s and '80s that uh, integrating the history and the philosophy of science was the was the wave of the future. Uh, and so there were loads of graduate programs of which uh, Dan and I went to one of the surviving. Uh, there remain at Indiana, Notre Dame, Cambridge, sort of at Purdue and, and uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, maybe a couple others, not that many. Um, yeah, 
Chicago, yeah, 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 yeah. CHS is kind of a kind of a wild card, but yeah, yeah. Um, not that many. There were many more uh, programs that really take as a card carrying move, uh, 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 trying to integrate this. And and what I'll say is, how to put it? I mean, I there's a lot in there not to like, but I I I kind of. I think you could take pretty seriously the first paragraph of Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions. And right at the very beginning of the book, he says something to the effect of, if we had a serious and careful vision of the history of science, there are a lot of things in the philosophy of science that would not be the same. Um, and there's parts where that's over, overdrawn, but I mean, I think, I think there's, I think there's really something to that. And so Part of what, and now I don't have the chance to do this, uh, how to put it, I don't have a chance to do this work here because I have to get the history right. Uh, and so you're right. This is, this book is, this is the most historical thing I've ever written. I'm, at, I'm a bit scared by that fact, frankly, uh, because I, I have an HPS degree, but I consider myself a philosopher, not a historian of science. Um, but I think telling the story of these sophisticated and interesting philosophies of science that are at work in this period has to have, does have, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm writing you a promissory note right now, but has real impact for how we think about the relationship between these still extant chancy and probabilistic theories in the biological world, evolutionary theory. Sorry, yes, HPS does stand for history and philosophy of science. Yes, my apologies. Um, does, does teach us something very interesting and very important about um, how we should understand the relationship between these statistically phrased biological theories in the natural world. Uh, I think that's, I think that's really important. I think, uh, I think they are trying out, and here I can, I'm actually kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing the, the interpretive frame of Hasek Chang. I think there's a sense in which sometimes we find that these historical figures worked out really interesting ideas for philosophical or even scientific approaches to questions that we lost because, for good reasons when their sciences uh, stopped being empirically uh, productive or fruitful. Um, but that don't deserve to be intellectually lost, that really can cast interesting light on how a philosopher of science might think about, you know, the theory world relationship in, uh, in natural selection, for example. And, and so actually, you know, I've, I've also done a load of work on kind of contemporary causal foundations of evolutionary theory work. And that's been really informed, I think, by the engagement that I've had with these, with these historical figures. So it's a methodology that's really worked out, worked well for me. I, I, I learn a lot when I go, when I go back to these texts. Um, and, and, I, and I think philosophy of science, contemporary philosophy of science can learn a lot uh, when, we go, when we go back to these texts. Um, not a knockdown argument. And that leaves, like I say, it leaves a lot of uh, kind of pr whatever future promissory notes um, uh, 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 in the pipeline, but I, but I, I think, I think there's something to it. At least I hope there's something to it. It was very helpful. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sure. I think that, uh, short manifesto and apology for integrated HPS is a, a fantastic note for us to end on today. Uh, so please join me, uh, once again in virtually thanking Charles Pence for joining us today. Thank you guys so much. This was this was super fun and the questions were fantastic. I I I I extremely appreciate it. It was phenomenal. Thank y'all.